Hey everybody, back with another video. Um, in this video, we are going to talk briefly about what is pride and how it relates to the art community and how it's affected the art community. Um, once again, there will be a bunch of links um, all throughout this video. They'll be up on screen, uh, but I'll also have those links down in the description box below this video so that you can access them more easily. So you can either pause the video and write them down or copy them over into your browser, or you can link to them down below. Again, just like the Juneteenth video, this isn't meant to be all comprehensive. Um, this is a launching off point. So we're going to be covering these this topic fairly briefly. I'll be brushing on all of the high points. Um, and I do recommend that you take a look at some of these links so you can get into some more deeper study. So let's get started. So homosexuality um, was illegal in most parts of the world. Homosexuality, gayness, queerness, um, being LGBTQIA, any of these identities um, were considered sexual deviants um, in the um, you know medical community. Um, it was considered a mental illness um, to be any of these things for a very long time, um, and even in the you know, the mental health community. Um, this was considered a mental illness and you could be hospitalized. You could be, uh, you know, have shock treatment, um, all sorts of terrible things, chemical, um, you know, treatments to erase your sexuality. All sorts of terrible things were done to people to quote unquote correct this quote unquote illness during this time. And this was true uh, in the United States for, um, most of the United States history up until fairly recently. Um, and there was this uh, legislation that happened during this time, during the 20th century, called the Lavender Scare. And the Lavender Scare, that's what you have up on your screen right now, is a um, the opening of a document, kind of the facing page of a document um, talking about some of this legislation. And what the Lavender Scare is, that term refers to oppressive legislation towards the LGBTQIA community during a huge chunk of the 20th century. The title itself is wordplay. It's play on the term Red Scare, which was popular at the same time. Red Scare is referring to an irrational fear fear of communist infiltration. So of, you know, the communists coming over and taking over American culture and American civilization. By comparison, the Lavender Scare uh, is referring to a similar irrational fear, but this time this fear is of members of the LGBTQIA community. So both of these fears resulted in legislative actions that amounted to really nothing more than the proverbial witch hunt. Um, and these hunts served to negatively affect the lives of thousands of American citizens. It struck needless fear into the hearts of middle America. Um, and that's where a lot of these, you know, negative practices began. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of the anti-LGBTQIA scare language and rhetoric that we still hear today um, was invented during this time or kind of came around during this time. And so while we still have, we still see in kind of the corners of our legislative bodies, uh, we see some of this fear mongering still existing, but it's to a much lesser extent than it was um, even 80 years ago. Most bars and clubs um, during the 20th century would not allow gay people or queer people to patronize their shops. So again, not only was homosexuality illegal, but it was also considered immoral and a mental illness. So you would see by the 1950s, the only bars that would allow homosexuals into their establishments were owned by the mafia. So the mafia would use these clubs to launder money. Um, they were not always well taken care of. Um, they were usually pretty seedy kind of establishments. Um, but because they were the crux of the illegal activity by these mafia members, they weren't at all concerned with their clientele. They didn't care who came in the door. And so um, this became a safe haven for uh, gay people to 
attend and to go into and be themselves. Now, the police were very aware of these establishments and they used the mafia laundering schemes as an excuse to go in and bust these establishments, to conduct raids on these establishments. And they would do this from time to time. Um, from the police's standpoint, it was kind of, you'll pardon the expression, killing two birds with one stone. And during these raids, um, they would treat gay people inside very badly. They would beat them, they would drag them outside, they would make fun of them, um, they would throw them outside to be gathered up in a paddy wagon and taken to jail. Um, the next day, uh, you would see a list of names and sometimes the professions of these people listed in the newspaper. Uh, and so people would lose their jobs over this. Uh, they would lose their marriages, their homes, etc. It would literally devastate people and ruin their lives. So not only did they have a criminal record for being a sexual deviant, that's what they would go to jail for, a sexual deviancy, public de uh, deviancy, um, but they would also, um, you know, be publicly shamed. So many of these folks um, would eventually become homeless and they'd have to turn to dealing drugs or sex work just to survive. By the 1960s, um, we start to see the civil rights movement uh, be in full swing. And because of this civil rights movement, this really made a lot of marginalized people start to take a look at how they were being treated. Um, and they started to become discontent with this kind of treatment. The LGBTQIA community being among those minority groups. And so while some of the laws had changed over time, um, so that being uh, homosexual, for example, was no longer illegal in New York City by the 60s, um, the police would still harass these people and they would still haul them off to jail, um, taunt them in the streets, make fun of them, um, you know, all this sort of thing and just give them generally a hard time. So tensions started to rise as more social political movements became active in the late 1960s and the counterculture created an environment for more progressive ideas. So therefore, in the early morning hours of June 28th, 1969, at the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village, New York City, the police decided they would conduct another routine raid. Little did they know it would be their last. Now it's unknown who started the resistance that night, but buoyed on by smaller resistances that had happened throughout the city earlier in the decade, this once routine raid quickly turned into a riot. So we start to see the patrons of the bar start to push back against the police force who are trying to bully and harass them. Meanwhile, bystanders outside the bar start to gather around and Greenwich Village became this counterculture, kind of the hub of counterculture. And they were annoyed and irritated by the police uh, treatment of the homosexuals as well and of the LGBTQIA community. I'm sorry, I keep using those terms interchangeably. Uh, understand at the time they didn't have the language that we have now to discuss the community. So very often it was just referred to as the gay community or the queer community, um, sometimes in much less favorable terms. So for the sake of this discussion, I am using those terms fairly fluidly um, and fairly interchangeably. Um, and that's just due to the lack of nuance to the language that was being used at the time historically. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, um, bystanders out the, outside of the bar and patrons within the bar started, both started to resist and push back against the police show of force. And they eventually pinned these police down between these two progressively angry and very fed up groups of people. Eventually, the police had to run into the very Stonewall Inn that they had tried to raid and they barred themselves and barricaded themselves inside and tried to call for backup from the police force. This riot lasted two complete days. Now more reinforcements did come and they were able to break up the riots both days, 
but it still was this moment of civil unrest. The police often said, you know, were, were heard to have said, we didn't expect, you know, these people to push back. They'd always been so passive before because they were always terrified of what this might do to their lives. But now, you know, the tide was changing and the world was changing and the world was becoming more aware of what, you know, being gay and being LGBT meant. Uh, and so they started to push back and they started to expect more equal treatment. So, um, I, you know, they, the police were just not used to the gay community lashing out, but they had clearly had enough. And this event sparked organization and activism within the LGBTQIA community that had never been seen before. This is, while not the first protest, while not the biggest riot necessarily, this is probably one of the most um, reported on uh, and one of the most famous riots. And so this is really what galvanized the LGBTQIA community into a cohesive whole and allowed them to speak up for themselves for the first time. Every year after that riot, to keep the memory and the activism alive, a parade has been held to commemorate those brave people who fought for their rights on that day. So it started out as just a way to keep that memory alive, to just keep people remembering, look, we're not putting up with this anymore. It wasn't just a one-time thing. They were worried about those riots being forgotten and, and the little ground that they were able to gain from that kind of visibility to be forgotten. They wanted to be remembered, right? We still aren't gonna take this. We still aren't going to be pushed around. We still aren't gonna be thrown in jail for just being who we are. And so they started this tradition of every year having this parade as a reminder, right? Uh, as a visible reminder of we are here and you have to deal with us, right? You have to accept that that's, what's, that's who we are. So how does this affect the art world, right? That might be your next question. Well, because of this success from protest, we see visibility and this visibility allows these artists, these visual artists, a platform on which to speak. So we start to see um, openly gay um, artists express themselves and their lives openly. We see this explosion of art and music and theater and literature and poetry. No longer were these people to be the butt of the jokes or just a character to be played for laughs. Instead, we see an explosion of these artists throughout the 1960s and onward who were finally able to be public about who they were and to try and gain this kind of level of visibility, which eventually turned into acceptance. So this activism um, serves the community well when they are forced to face their next adversary in the 1980s. And that, of course, is the AIDS epidemic. So in the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s and 1990s, we see artists like Robert Maplethorpe, who we saw a couple of slides back, Keith Haring, who we'll see in the next uh, couple of slides, and several other artists use this as a backdrop on which to make their art. Some of these artists, unfortunately, ended up becoming infected with the AIDS virus, such as Keith Haring. Uh, and that's what ended up, uh, he ended up dying from complications due to AIDS. And so they, and nobody was talking about it. The president at the time refused to talk about the AIDS crisis and take it seriously, uh, you know, in kind of a backlash against all of the civil rights and things that had happened in the 60s and 70s. Um, a lot of, you know, politicians, um, you know, saw this as a comeuppance and, you know, oh, this is just, you know, a gay disease and it is killing them off and that's what they deserve. Um, and there was a lot of really nasty rhetoric still going on at that time. And so this gave these artists a platform and they were allowed, they used this as a way to move back. So you started to see posters and graffiti and all kinds of public art being made by these artists used to, uh, you know, 
create this dialogue, to create this narrative, to get the information out there to people so that there wasn't this silence, there wasn't this cover up. So it's because of these artists um, and them using their voice and using their art to create these very um, visual pieces uh, that a conversation was had at all. Um, so we see, you know, for example, Harvey Milk in San Francisco, he's the first uh, openly gay politician, uh, and he furthers the, um, you know, AIDS research. And we start to see these artists make all this money and they donate it to the AIDS research. Then we start to see allies in the artistic community, such as Madonna and um, you know, actors like Liz Taylor who lend their voice to the AIDS crisis. And so it kind of all builds um, where we see, you know, because of this visibility, uh, you know, we see this kind of normalization, right, of the LGBTQIA community. And now we can start to have this conversation about things that affect this community and how it really affects all of us. More contemporary artists, such as Juliana Huxtable, who we see here, um, use intersectionality in their art. So intersectionality is when you aren't just looking at one aspect of yourself and who you are, but you're layering these different things, right? What if you're, you know, not just a woman, but what if you're a trans woman? What if you're a trans woman of color? What if you are demisexual? What if you are, you know, all these different things? Because most of us aren't just identified by one thing or one experience in our life, but we are identified by a multiplicity of things. And it's through this kind of intersectionality of these different kinds of issues that we can begin to understand each other in a more complex way. And so uh, in the notion of intersectionality is um, written about by Kimberly Crenshaw, um, who is an activist uh, writer. Uh, and um, I'll post her a link to her writings down below too, if you're not familiar with that term intersectionality um, and that theory. Um, but, you know, we see artists like Juliana Huxtable, who is working in that space and is layering race and gender and queerness and identity in her work. And so we get this full picture of who she is. So um, that is my very quick lecture on the Pride Movement. Um, here is our links um, to all these resources. Again, these will be down in the description box below. I know this was really super fast, um, but I hope this was useful to you and I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you understand a little bit more now about uh, where Pride came from and why it's celebrated at the end of June uh, every year. So thanks again and I will see you in the discussion boards.